Good evening to everyone, and welcome to the Student Union Building and to Dalhousie University. My name is Camille Cameron. I'm the Dean of the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie and the moderator for this panel. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we're holding this event here this evening on traditional Mi'kmaq territory. I've been asked to read this notice to everyone. Please note, tonight's event is being recorded and will be posted to youtube.com at Schulich Law, perhaps among other, place, other YouTube places. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome you all here this evening for this panel discussion, Marijuana, Is Canada Ready? And um, to show you how lively this panel will be, in a four-word title, we've already had some <laughs> controversy about two of those words. And uh, that controversy will be revealed as you listen to the speakers. I will introduce the panel in a moment, and we'll get right to it. But before I do that, a word from your sponsors. This event is co-hosted by the Faculty of Arts, Law, and Management here at Dalhousie, and with a community partner for this event, Genome Atlantic. The collaboration with uh, the three faculties began about a year ago when we decided that we should come together periodically to host public events like this one on topics of high public interest. Our first panel event was called Trump, Now What? <laughs> Uh, prescient. It was held four days before Trump's inauguration and it was a very popular event which will come as no surprise to most of you. Then we asked ourselves how do we trump Trump and the topic of the legalization of uh, marijuana was a pretty easy choice. Panels such as this one are an opportunity for us to share uh, with the university community and with the broader community inquiry, curiosity, and learning, the things that are the lifeblood of a university. We're very pleased to be partnering with Genome Atlantic to host this event. Genome Atlantic is a not-for-profit organization that uses genomics in research and development, uh, aimed at leading to solutions in a number of areas, including food production, natural resources, fisheries, and health, among others. They have an impressive solutions-based research portfolio, and we were very pleased to find out that they were just as interested in this topic and in organizing a panel as we were. So we came together uh, as partners. What are some of the key questions that surround the issue of the legalization of marijuana? That's the purpose of this evening's panel, to identify and to explore some of these questions. Um, and before we get to that, I just want to say a few thank yous. There's always a lot of work that goes into an event like this. Um, this one started innocently enough, but actually grew uh, in, uh, in size and, and in interest. And it did take a fair bit of work um, to get us all here this evening. So I just want to th say thank you to Lindsay Loomer and Jane Doucette in the School of Law Communications Office, to Charmaine Gaudet at Genome Atlantic, Director of External Relations for Genome, and to Elizabeth Sanford in the Dean's Office at the Law School. I'll now turn to the panel and to panel introductions. I will begin with Anne McClellan. The Honorable A. Anne McClellan is the Chair of Canada's Task Force on Cannabis Legalization and Regulation, She's the Dalhousie University Chancellor, and she's also, by the way, the former Deputy Prime Minister of Canada. She will give an overview of the process and key recommendations of the Task Force on Cannabis Legalization and Regulation. Next, we have Archie Kaiser. Professor Kaiser is with the Schulich School of Law and the Department of Psychiatry at Dalhousie University. He will address some issues related to the function and limits of the criminal law including prohibition and enforcement models, reasons for and dimensions of the failure of criminalization, and the boundaries between public health and the criminal law after legalization. Next, we have Professor Eileen Donovan Wright. Professor Wright is with the Department of Pharmacology, Dalhousie University. She's promised me that she won't use really, really big words. <laughs> Uh, there are some eight-syllable and nine-syllable words. She's got the lawyer's beat, I think. Uh, she will address issues regarding the science of cannabis, including how cannabinoids can affect brain function, differences among different groups of people, 
the need for a knowledge-based risk-benefit analysis, and some gaps that exist in our knowledge and that require further research. Next, we have Daryl Dexter. The Honorable Daryl Dexter is currently Vice Chair, Global Public Affairs. He is a former Premier of Nova Scotia, and he is currently an Honorary Fellow with the McKechnie Institute for Public Policy and Governance at Dalhousie. He will talk about the legislative models and distribution issues that arise with regard to legalization, including the various possible distribution models that might be considered. He'll identify some problems and challenges that arise for provinces and territories related to distribution and the need for more research. Next, we have Sylvain Charlebois. Um, professor Sylvain Charlebois is the Dean Faculty of Medicine and a professor at the in the Faculty of Agriculture at Dalhousie University. He will report on a national survey on cannabis-infused food products that he and a colleague have recently uh, conducted. And finally, we have Professor Melanie Kelly. Professor Kelly is with the Departments of Pharmacology and Ophthalmology, Anesthesia, Pain Management, and Perioperative Medicine, Dalhousie University. She will talk about the need to maintain strong medical cannabis cannabinoid access for patients after legalization and to focus research on therapeutics rather than just on harm reduction. And she'll also discuss some of the reasons why Canadians are currently using medical cannabis and cannabinoids. And I've introduced myself. I'm Camille Cameron, the dean of the Schulich School of Law. So each panelist will have uh, 12 minutes. We have a timekeeper. Thank you, Fabian. One of our law students has kindly agreed to be a timekeeper. And I've told the panelists that at the end of 12 minutes, if they're still talking, a hook will come down from the ceiling and take them away. Um, I, I may have to interrupt uh, some of them, so please don't think me impolite. I'm keen for everybody to have a chance to speak and then to reserve some time for questions and answers from the floor. And we have reserved about 40 minutes for some questions and answers. So, marijuana, is Canada ready? Who better to start us off than Anne McClellan, the chair of Canada's task force on cannabis legalization and regulation, and one of the people who's going to take issue with the title right off the bat. The task force has presented a very detailed report on the issues that have to be considered as we move toward legalization. She will tell us about the main recommendations of the task force. Thank you very much, Camille. Can, is my mic on? Can everybody hear me? Great, good. Um, as Camille has indicated, yes, I uh, will have a few words off the top to say about the title. Others will talk more of, uh, in a more fulsome fashion around the use of the word marijuana. If any of you have looked at our task force report, we make it very clear early in the report. We do not use that language. It is slang. We do not think it's appropriate. Uh, the cannabis plant is a very complex plant with over 100 and some active agents, we decided, and the scientists on the pa panel decided early, out of the box, our first meeting, if we're going to do this, let's treat this plant with the respect it deserves. So you will see uh, in the report only the use of the word cannabis in whatever form it may be found or taken, and generally I try to avoid in my, in my spoken word any reference to the uh, uh, word marijuana. Now, but I, uh, that is, I've got that off my chest. Um, is Canada ready? Well, the answer to that is no, but nobody should be surprised or panicked. So if there's media in the room, don't rush out and say, McClellan says government not ready, because it's the wrong question. I would agree that the government is not ready right now, but we're still my nine months out uh, before, in fact, there, uh, we will go live, if you like, in terms of in and around July 2018. The real question we should all be asking ourselves, is Canada getting ready? And is Canada doing the things we need to do in our component parts and citizens to be ready for when we go live in and around July? 2018. And I do want to spend just a little bit of time telling you about what the government 
governments are doing, in fact, to get ready. Uh, first of all, as you've heard, the federal government, keep in mind, uh, it was the party of which I am a member, the Liberal Party of Canada, that, in fact, during the last election made the commitment to legalize and regulate. Our job as the task force was to tell the government how. How, after listening to Canadians across this country, experts, activists, whoever wanted to talk to us and submit to us, our task was to make recommendations to the government as to how to fulfill their public policy commitment around legalization and regulation. Um, as you know, the government has introduced legislation this very day. It's going through clause by clause in the Health Committee where I and my Vice Chair, Mark Ware, appeared a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there is a lot of work being done behind the scenes, separate and apart from the legislation. Regulations are being drafted in anticipation of legislation being passed. I also want to reassure you the government, uh, public servants are working diligently with their provincial and territorial counterparts. There are a number of working groups in place right now, as you can imagine, bearing down on the details. Seed to sale, one of our recommendations to prevent diversion and to ensure uh, quality control, a working group in relation to that, a working group in relation to ticketing. There will be ticketing offenses both in the federal legislation and at the provincial level. The governments have decided they want one uniform ticket that law enforcement will use throughout the nation. They're working on that. Public education, if you've looked at our report, is key as we move forward through this transformation. There is a federal, provincial, territorial uh, group working on public education to ensure all the messages around public education are in fact uh, uniform and symmetrical. So there's a lot of work being done at the federal level right now to get ready. Now, in relation to the provinces, as you've seen, consultations are going on in almost all provinces. Ontario, we've got their model, ladies and gentlemen, and it's come under a fair bit of criticism. In New Brunswick, we don't have their retail model, but we know they're out there purchasing supply, and probably the government most supportive overall of the legalization and regulation of cannabis. We know that Quebec and Alberta tomorrow, my province, Alberta, will in fact release at least uh, an overview of their uh, proposal and approach to legalization and regulation. Quebec is close and other provinces are lining up. And of course, we have the first minister's meeting today and I was chatting to one of the officials outside the door just before coming over here and the first ministers had actually not begun their discussion of the cannabis agenda item, but I'm I'm sure by the six o'clock news or a little later here in Nova Scotia, we will have some insight as to what is uh, happening at the First Minister's meeting. So the right question is, is Canada getting ready? Yes. Canada is getting ready. Is there lots more work to do? Absolutely there is. But that work is being done. Will there be surprises along the road? Of course there will be. Will we learn from others? Yes. The task force visited Colorado, Washington, we talked to the Oregon, and uh, we talked to our friends in Uruguay, the first country to legalize at the national level. So we are learning from others. We will continue to learn from others as we move through this journey of transformation. But Canada is in a unique position. We are the first OECD country to in fact legalize and regulate, and the world is watching us. The world really did not pay that much attention to Uruguay when they legalized. The world, including the UN, is watching, are watching us very closely. Why did Mr. Trudeau and the Government of Canada decide to legalize and regulate uh, cannabis? Well, it's pretty clear that after decades of prohibition, prohibition was not achieving either the public safety or public health objectives that it was supposed to, in fact, achieve. We in Canada have the highest youth use in the world. I usually use slides, but there's no time. But if you look at the age cohorts 15 to 19, 21% of that age group have indicated they used in the past year. 20 to 24, 30% of that age group has indicated that they used in the past year. Interestingly, 25 
and plus, uh, use, use falls off uh, to 10%. But actually, we in the task force believe one of the major growth areas for cannabis use is my generation, the boomer generation, <laughs> as we deal with our aches and pains, <laughs> among other things, I guess. Um, if you look at the latest uh, statistics from UNICEF, they will tell you that if you're looking at the age cohorts 11, 13, and 15, approximately 27.5% of Canadian youth in those age cohorts uh, indicate that they have used cannabis. So if prohibition was to prevent young people and others from using, it's been an abysmal failure. Let's look at whether prohibition was to take illegality out of the supply of cannabis. Again, an abysmal failure. We have an illegal market in this country of at least $7 billion. When I say illegal, that is not all organized crime. And in fact, there's huge debate, and Archie probably knows this, huge debate among criminologists and social scientists as to how much uh, organized crime there is in the cannabis business. But if you talk to law enforcement, it is significant. But the illegal market is not only organized crime, it's everything but medicinal currently. And that is a huge market. So prohibition hasn't prevented the growth of the illegal market marketplace. It's also led to the uh, lack of respect for the rule of law because the vast majority of Canadians do not think it should be a crime to possess small amounts for personal use. And you never want laws on your books that actually start to uh, undermine respect for the rule of law. Our police, our law enforcement, they will tell you they don't want to waste their limited time and resources enforcing personal possession charges. Again, that leads to a lack of respect and confusion around the enforcement of the law. We have regional variations in the enforcement of the law, even variations within provinces. Urban Edmonton, the police force, takes a different approach than a rural small town community in the north of the province. That too leads to disrespect for the rule of law. And we have racialized enforcement of this law, and there's more and more evidence that, in fact, African Canadians and Indigenous Canadians are subject to many more charges of personal possession uh, than others, Caucasians, for example. And we have no quality control over the product that people are buying illegally. You could get ground up cement in your cannabis, and you're paying $8 a gram for cannabis and ground up cement or things that are much, much more dangerous, like fentanyl. So, has prohibition worked, ladies and gentlemen? No, it hasn't. How many times do you hit your head against that wall in the back before you say, maybe it is time, as a country, to think about a different approach? And that's what uh, the Government of Canada did after the last election. They put the task force in place and uh, we made 80 recommendations. I know, I'm running out of time. We made 80 recommendations. The basic principles we put in play, the precautionary principle, everywhere we went, people who've gone down this road, the states in the U.S. and Uruguay, take your time, be cautious out of the box, because as I've said, there will be surprises. You don't know what your surprises will be, but there will be surprises, so be cautious. As the market develops, as you learn in terms of who's using and how much, and health and safety issues, you can always go in and loosen the rules. So you will see that principle reflected in our report. Also, all our recommendations are based on either public health or public safety protection. Very quickly, we chose the age of 18. I think others may talk about that. Uh, we believe that uh, with the right public education, responsible young adults can make the decision as to whether they want to use, hopefully moderately, for uh, personal use uh, after the age of 18. Uh, certainly the Canadian Medical Association and some others disagree, and we're respectful of their points of view. But we actually feel that if someone is old enough to serve their country, country without their parents' consent at 18, with the right public education, they're old enough to decide whether they should use cannabis in whatever form. Like, uh, we made recommendations around licensed producers. Where's the product going to come from? Licensed producers will be the only legal producers in Canada. We want to bring some of those craft and artisanal producers, a lot of them in the Okanagan uh, and elsewhere, but particularly the Okanagan, a lot of expertise there. We want to bring those people into the legal system. Um, 
but the federal government will regulate uh, and license production and manufacturing. The provinces are responsible for retail. I think Daryl and others are going to talk about that. You've seen Ontario's model. You only compete with organized crime. You have to have three things to take organized crime out of any market. You've got to have choice of whatever the product is. You've got to have quality and price. I am not sure. Uh, whether um, a, a government-owned uh, retail um, uh, concept, concept will actually be able to do that. I think the jury's out, but the joy of this country is some people will use a government-owned model, others will use another model, and we will learn as we move forward. Uh, I have zero time. Uh, we recommend the continuation of the medicinal route, for, uh, medicinal uh, path for at least the next five years and to be reviewed after that. And edibles, yes, we recommend edibles. It's the growth part of the market and I will stop there. Thank you. Good evening. I'm used to standing in front of a classroom, but usually I don't have as many students, so <laughs> I'm probably going to be nervous. I wish to thank my fellow panelists and you in the audience for coming together to confront the vital public policy issues that are inherent in the legalization of cannabis or marijuana, as you wish. The question posed by the title of our talk can, in some senses, be answered succinctly. Yes, Canada is ready to implement the legalization of cannabis. Indeed, we were poised to make this choice almost 100 years ago but instead we took the wasteful, damaging, reflexive, and self-defeating path of prohibition and punishment. In my opinion, we are now a nation in recovery, legally, constitutionally, and morally, ready to take the wiser, fairer, and ultimately safer direction of legalization. We are approaching legalization thoughtfully and at a moderate pace. In my limited time, I can only address a few major issues. I will not be presenting a detailed analysis of Bill C-45, the Cannabis Act, or Bill C-46, an act to amend the criminal code relating to conveyances. That's essential, but it's better that it be done elsewhere. Overall, I believe this legislation has the right trajectory. My focus is on general principles and history, rationality and restraint. I'll talk about the function and limits of the criminal law. I'll review the history of our use of the prohibition and enforcement model. I'll explain the reasons for and dimensions of the failure of the criminalization approach. I'll begin to delineate the boundaries between public health regulation and the residual role of the criminal law. I'll suggest the need to bring the same compelling rationality which resulted in legalization of cannabis to our considering what to do with respect to other still riskier uh, and prohibited substances. So first I'll address the purposes and limits of the criminal law and our ill-fitting drug policy. According to the Supreme Court of Canada, criminal law can help distill positively the basic set of communal values shared by all Canadians. Here, our prohibitionist regime has conspicuously failed. Hundreds of thousands of Canadians never accepted that the use of cannabis was wrong and harmful and have defied the criminal law. The criminalization of this vast segment of our population served only, as Anne has said, to reduce the legitimacy of the criminal law. In our stubborn loyalty to the enforcement model, we tilted well away from the judicial, parliamentary, and royal commission agreement on the role of the criminal law in Canadian society. Authoritative statements about when the criminal law should be deployed were disregarded. The Canadian consensus has been that we should only use the criminal law as a last resort, an unavoidable necessity for behavior which cannot be controlled by other social forces and legal devices. In our country, our legal institutions have said repeatedly that the watchword is restraint, that we should only very reluctantly and sparingly use the criminal sanction. We haven't been faithful to those principles for many decades, and instead we overuse the criminal law, obfuscating many vital societal needs. I want to address briefly our history of enthusiastic prohibition. Much of the world drug trade was relatively unregulated, and substance use was common until the early 1900s. Alcohol and tobacco were seen as more damaging. 
Drugs have been employed for pain and symptom relief, relaxation, stimulation, spiritual enhancement, and a means of exchange. Religiously fueled notions of sobriety then motivated an unjustified redefinition of many substances as both unhealthy and degenerative. Other volatile propellants of prohibition were racial discrimination and political scapegoating. Headlines in British Columbia newspapers in 1920 ignoring the use of the, by the white middle class of opium-laced popular remedies opined, this is a quote, the local chief of police has been busy of late in the prosecution of the heathen Chinese for dallying with the forbidden opium. More broadly, Emily Murphy, famous for her being a pioneering feminist, also waged a vicious anti-drug campaign, leaking drugs, race, and crime. And this is again a quote from the revered Emily. There is a well-defined propaganda among the aliens of color to bring about the degeneration, degeneration of the white race. So, in response to all of that, Canada leaped upon the criminal bandwagon, and we embraced successive waves of international criminalization. We criminalized cannabis in the 1920s with virtually no parliamentary debate, let alone study. Canada became a willing participant in what emerged as the war on drugs by the 1970s, despite occasional backward glances at more enlightened approaches. For example, the 1972 report on the non-medical use of drugs and the 2002 Special Senate Committee. We concentrated on enforcement and punishment. We minimized or silenced harm reduction, prevention, and any educational messaging other than abstinence. The war on drugs was very seductive for us. Parliament, I regret to say our courts, and the police eagerly adopted the war metaphor. We paid little attention to the costs of its prosecution in terms of blood, treasure, principle, rationality, and constitutional values. Perhaps its attractions emerged from war's reductionism. When we think of war, it, it describes a world uh, which is more understandable for us. Evil can be pursued with a fundamentalist zeal, a morally certain, even heroic faith. Our actual perceptions of harm and cost are obscured when we concentrate on war. The effects of this war. The tangible and intangible negative effects of our war now seem obvious, given our partial ceasefire regarding cannabis. But this recognition underpins my contention that we are a nation in recovery. As Anne has said, and as all of us recognize, prohibition has failed to reduce supply, demand, and potency. Enforcement has totally inaccurately conflated users, addicts, and even organized crime. Reliance on the criminal model grossly intruded on the decision-making of a autonomous adults, even as the consumption of more harmful substances was legalized and facilitated. Marginalized, often racialized individuals, families, and communities were affected disproportionately. The public health dimensions of drug use were neglected. An illicit industry was spawned with its penumbra of associated crimes, violence, corruption, and untaxed, undirected revenue. Suppression diminished the reverence for the criminal law for small-time users and distributors were never perceived by the public as genuine antisocial outlaws. Our police and our courts, again, devalued too many citizens and lost sight of the democratic expectation that police powers were to be used in a restrained and respectful manner. We imprisoned and we stigmatized far too many Canadians. Now we are changing our direction. The climb down from the ascendancy of the criminal law requires a disciplined redirection towards public health promotion and protection and a rededication to human rights and equality. Now we can open ourselves to rational consideration of the evidence, which our fellow panelists will bring in part to you tonight, rather than simply penalizing anything else other than abstinence. We can now consider a multiplicity of harm-reducing services and supports. The destructive effects and failures of the eliminationist impulse can be minimized as we redirect our energies. As the UN Commissioner for Human Rights recently stated, 
Repressive responses have posed unnecessary risks to public health, creating significant barriers to the full and effective realization of the right to health. With a particularly devastating impact on minorities, those living in situations of rural and urban poverty, and people who use drugs. Let me comment upon the proper, if reduced, role of the criminal law following legalization. There is a role for the criminal law and regulatory law in the aftermath of the legalization of cannabis. It must protect young people. It must assist in maintaining transportation and workplace safety. It must address activities well beyond the zone of lawfulness. It must assist in taxing profits equitably and ensuring revenues promote health, provide rehabilitative options, invigorate education, and supplement government coffers. One author has put it this way, that we need to use criminal and regulatory law to control the eight Ps coherently. Production, the profit motive, promotion, prevention, potency, purity, price, and public health. We also need to, is that peace or is that two minutes? <laughs> We need to deploy the criminal law in a way which will avoid hollow legalization. We need to keep possessors and small-scale cultivators outside the grasp of the criminal law. And for those who offend a newly configured penal law, we need to offer alternative measures where possible, ensure offenders are penalized moderately, remove many of the recently installed mandatory minimum penalties, refocus on violent and organized crime. We ought not to tolerate discriminatory law enforcement patterns. We ought not to use public health concerns to compel treatment, which would violate the principles of restraint and undermine respect for adult decision making. I want to close, as I'm told to, uh, with a plea that the citizenry and parliament consider a clean policy slate with respect to other psychoactive substances. We need the same prioritization of public health, human rights, while preserving public safety even as other substances may require a different equilibrium between legalization and decriminalization. The war on drugs was an abject failure. The marijuana ceasefire should be extended to a generalized peace treaty. The blunt weapon of the criminal law should be largely sheathed as we can reduce harm and protect public health and the social order differently for other now prohibited substances. I have an additional page and a half. <laughs> Thank you. Your, your applause and the timekeeper have given me the right message. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if you've forgotten the order that we were presenting in, my name's Eileen Denman Wright. I'm a research scientist, so I'm not a clinician. I'm a research scientist. I am honored to be as part of this panel. This is such an important discussion for all of us, and I'm I'm uh, absolutely thrilled at the the call to having public education and better knowledge. I feel that the one of the best things that we can do tonight is all come away with a slightly more sophisticated um, evidence to, that we can go forward as this debate continues. I've been given a very simple job and to sort of level the playing field with really how does can cannabis uh, affect brain function. Also, I really would like to pose the question to all of you, when it comes to cannabis, are we all the same? What makes us different? What makes us unique? And particularly, and this is how I was associated with the uh, Genome Atlantic, what is the role that genetics can tell us? So what can genetics tell us about how we can predict who is at risk for developing both physical and mental illnesses, perhaps, that are associated with the use of cannabis as we go forward in this new environment? What can genetics tell us about the people that already have health issues or whatnot that might actually be the ones that could most benefit from cannabis use? And although I'm not going to talk about it, there's also a whole role of genetics in the plants that we're going to grow and how we're going to harness that power to go forward as we go into production. So, in other words, what we really need to do is come away from this at the end of the evening, knowing not only are we on the road to very good policy and on, are we on the road to 
ending the war on drugs, as Archie said, but we're really on the road as a very educated population to understand that we need to develop really good approaches for, for evidence collection and the use not only in the present, but as we go forward and learn more as we are in this process of developing our sophistication as a country. If anyone hasn't read the task force, I urge you to do it. It's very accessible to people and it's very knowledgeable and it gives us great respect for, for the work that has gone into it. There's also other reports in the, uh, that are out there that you, I urge you to, to uh, use them. So what is cannabis? So we, we're not using marijuana, we're using cannabis. And cannabis has a long history. We've got at least a 5,000 year history of using cannabis. We're just catching up now with good policy. It was part of our culture and religion, et cetera, as Archie said. What we do know is that cannabis as a plant, like many plants, contains hundreds of compounds. There's only a small proportion of those that are cannabinoids. They're very specific structurally and chemically. They're very lipophilic, that is, they like to live in tissues. These, these compounds have effect because they act on very specific receptors that are occurring in all of our bodies. So the drive to understand what was psychoactive about cannabis led to the discovery of both the chemicals that were present in these plants, but also a very important fundamental system in our bodies that was unknown really 30 years ago. We all have an endogenous cannabinoid system. This has receptors that respond to the cannabis that's in plants, but it also responds to compounds that all of us make all the time. Our brains are regulated and controlled and their functions modulated by this wonderful endogenous cannabinoid system, so the endocannabinoid system. And what this endocannabinoid system does is controls how neuron-to-neuron -neuron communication takes place. It's widespread. The cannabinoid receptors, especially the ones that are particularly focused in the brain, the, the type 1 cannabinoid receptors, are some of the most common receptors that are found in the brain. They're concentrated in areas that are very much involved in things like memory, emotion, cognition, that is our ability to think and, and uh, reason, our motivation, and our motor coordination. So it's not surprising that these are potent drugs when you apply them exo in exogenously, that when you are exposed to cannabinoids, they can have effects. Not all cannabinoids are psychoactive, like the major one in cannabis, tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, that everyone's heard of. Many of the other, of the more than 100 compounds, have different properties, but they all have a potential to both have possibly good medical, untapped medical potential, as well as potential harm. So what we really need to do is not only understand how these systems work, which is what scientists are working on, but understand where the harms are and um, where we have medical potential. So I had to write big because I, I don't, I was too vain to wear my reading glasses. I'll be completely frank about that. So. Most people are aware that there's short-term effects of the drugs. That is, when you're exposed to the drug, there's going to be some transient effects. So these include things like altered consciousness or how we perceive and, and process information, mood and behavior. I want to leave you with something to think about and to never forget as good, educated Canadians and, and no, budding pharmacologists. Dose matters. Dose always matters. So that means that the absolute amount of drug that you're exposed to as well as the frequency of use and the duration of use is important because it's really those things that lead to the long-term effects. The route of drug administ administration is going to be important. So whether we're talking about people smoking, which might have its own consequences, or vaporizing at, at lower temperatures, or using edibles that we're going to hear about. So, so route of administration is going to have some different effects. Long-term effects, you know, they're, they're we have to f face the fact that cannabinoids are somewhat unique drugs. They can't accumulate in bodies. So the brain can also change in response to chronic exposure to these drugs. High dose, high frequency, high potency drugs that are consumed over long periods of time can change the way our brains respond and alter this very important endogenous cannabinoid system that we need to have proper brain function. So, of course, there's going to be some people that may actually develop dependence. There may be some people that have, and there's good evidence for this, a compelling body of evidence, long-term cognitive impairment. 
And there's a growing body of evidence, and it's one of the areas of active research, is that some people are highly vulnerable to developing severe mental illness. Now, this is not to say that all people, that the drug is bad unto itself. It says to us that individuals differ, and it's genetics that are really going to play a role in helping us understand how individuals differ, and having each of us make good, informed decisions about how we use the drug. So we differ genetically. We know that. That, ma that makes sense. We differ in terms of our, our sex and gender, so that, that genetics that come in that, there's different responses between men and women. We need to face that and accept that. We know that probably the, the, um, the complex genetics that go into developing diseases are also, there's another set of complex genetics that are going to go to how we respond to these drugs. This is going to be important, but above and layered on top of all of this is that age is going to matter. As it's been alluded to, um, we have a lot of very young people using cannabis. And as we move forward, we have to accept that the adolescent brain, all the way from the 10, 12-year-olds are using, all the way up to the 25-year-olds, and the brain is still under development, are more vulnerable than adults. Importantly, Everyone should realize that the long-term consequences of cannabis use may be very different if use was started at a very at a young age or even in a late adolescent age compared to being an adult. So that we have to accept that we are going to be doing a very long-term experiment as people are exposed. Cannabis is getting stronger, so the plants themselves are changing. And maybe fewer boomers were smoking marijuana now because they don't realize it's actually a lot stronger than it used to be. Just putting that out there. So uh, importantly, there's a group at Dal, and I, I have to give a plug for the, somebody that I work close with, Dr. Rudolf Uhr, who's a psychiatrist here, part of the Severe Mental Illness Clinic. And, and he, is he and others around the world have recognized that the the potential for, the, for severe mental illness increases with cannabis use. When I say severe mental illness, it includes things like psychotic disorders, schizophrenia, bipolar depression, and major depression. So that we know that there's genetics, some, group, some individuals are more vulnerable to develop these illnesses. It's important for us to realize that cannabis is a very important modulator of that genetic influence so that we need to understand how that affects those individuals. The real question that we, I think, that we need to start looking at right now is, not everyone's going to be negatively affected by cannabis, if it's used responsibly and we understand that dose matters. But we do know that there are some individuals who could be highly harmed, and genetics may be the thing that we can predict early who needs better education to avoid this drug, especially during those critical periods of development. So. What is our future for brain function? Not only does dose matter and age matter and our gender matters and our ethnicity matters, but it's going to be that in future, we don't really know the full impact on brain function. And for myself, I don't know if people who have certain genetic predisposition to, to degenerative disorders are, have the potential to be helped by cannabis if they're exposed for long periods of time or be harmed. Will it treat symptoms or will it change disease progression? So I think that one of the things that we really need to do is understand that genetics play a role in our personal health management. We need research and we need to be open to, to being informed and mindful as we collect this data going forward. Our physicians need to have good discussions with us and we need to see ourselves not just one Canadian among millions, but also with individuals with a different genetic risk. So I'll leave it there, and thank you very much. Okay, um, good evening. Uh, I'm uh, Daryl Dexter. I'm uh, pleased to be part of this panel. Some of you may recognize me from other movies. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the challenges on the distribution side, and I'm going to start uh, really um, by talking about the legislative process and kind of where we are and what the time frames are, and, and then kind of more toward um, 
what the models will actually look like. So I'm, I'm kind of taking it on an article of faith because I can't actually see those screens that the title page is up. So I'm going to now go to the very first page, which is the, should be the legislative process. If I'm talking about something you have no idea what it is. Go back one. Moving back, back one. Ah, okay, there we go. Uh, legislation and uh, regulatory process, and, and this is important. Uh, as, this, as this slide points out, uh, this bill came, Bill uh, C-45 came to first reading in April uh, of this year, uh, moved to second reading in June, and then on to health com committee hearings. It just wrapped up a short uh, time ago. Um, um, the, uh, the hearings are complete, but the health committee is actually meeting right now, as we are sitting here, and in fact, I uh, not Five minutes ago, I got a note from one of my colleagues saying that there had just been an amendment uh, that was introduced around edibles, and I don't know if it has been, uh, if it was a government amendment or whether or not it's been passed, but this literally is developing, uh, this story continues to develop as we're, as we're sitting here, and as uh, the Chancellor pointed out, it's a good uh, chance that the, the, the Premiers will all have something to say about it uh, by the time we get out of here this evening. Now you can see I've left a, a question mark in this box between uh, where we are now and the provincial retail uh, market launch, which is in July of 2018. There's a good reason for that. I want to explore that time a little bit further so you can understand it. But I wanted you to know that there are things that are going to happen after that as well. So you have food regulatory and drug regulatory changes. So that are the regulations uh, which are going to uh, likely govern uh, edibles, which there is a, a, a uh, uh, a broad uh, conversation taking place on and then after that um, you're likely going to see regulation around cosmetic and veterinary uses uh, for uh, for cannabis so no surprise to anyone I'm sure that there are going to be cannabis infused uh, pet foods very low THC high on CBD because as I understand it THC is very dangerous uh, for animals um, so I'm going to move to the uh, to the next um, slide. Um, this is that box that had the uh, that had the uh, question mark in it. So we're at the the House of Commons uh, section. They're going through clause by clause. As I said, um, they are going to go on a break week from the 9th to the 13th. So the um, committee report will be tabled in the House of Commons either right before they go on break week or right after they get back. Uh, when they get back, they will go to the committee stage, debate and vote, and then third reading, debate and vote. So that will likely take to sometime in mid-November, at which point it will go to the Senate. And you can think of the Senate as the House of Commons only, you know, kind of rent and repeat. Right? So you have the same process, uh, first reading, second reading, debate, and vote, and then you have the committee stage. It will likely go uh, to the Committee on Social Affairs, uh, Science and Technology. Uh, that will take us up to December 22nd, at which point the Senate will take a break. They'll be on break from December 23rd to January 29th. Um, they'll come back on January 30th, and they will start the Senate committee. Uh, this will um, uh, include the, the study and the report, the, re the report stage debate vote, and the third reading uh, debate vote. So you're going to get to royal assent somewhere in late April. In mid-May, you're going to get regulations re uh, released for consultation in the Canada, Canada Gazette. This is very important for the uh, distribution model five to 30 day consultation period. Early mid-June, cabinet will approve regulations, I assume mid to late June, final regulations published to the Canada part two. So we are now mid to late June for a July 1st launch date of the provincial retail market. Um, well, what, what, does, what does this mean for the provinces? I'm going to get to this in a second. I want to now just have a look at the legislative provisions of Bill uh, C-45. Um, Section 69 of the bill is the actual uh, piece of the legislation um, that authorizes uh, the provinces to uh, create 
uh, the distribution model. And it, what it says is a person may possess, sell, or distribute uh, cannabis if the person is authorized under a provincial act that contains the legislative measures in uh, subsection C. Subsection C are a bunch of common sense kinds of things like security, record keeping, um, uh, who you can buy from, who you can sell to, not a problem. Um, uh, sections 36 and 37 are self-service dis displays and selling and, uh, and uh, distributing. You, you can't distri distribute by, a, by means of a dispensing device. So what they don't want is you to be able to go up to a Coke machine kind of style thing and, and, and have it dispensed. It's, a, it's, a, it's an odd misunderstanding of what dispensing technology is actually like these days, but I'll leave it at that for now. Um, the self-service display means that you cannot go in and you won't have a customer experience like you have in the provincial liquor stores. So you can't go in and look at product on a shelf and pick it off and, and, um, and go, uh, go up to a counter. So provincial distribution. So the provincial distribution has to comply with Bill C-45. As you, I have already, already laid out for you the path for this piece of legislation, which takes us up until June. So the provinces, in all likelihood, in the spring, are going to have to bring in some kind of framework legislation, which I assume they will hold until the House of Commons are actually finished um, their, uh, their legislation. It's, it's not impossible for that to be done. It's a little awkward, I think, but it's not, certainly not impossible. And, and in fact, if I had my druthers, I, I would rather see them actually stick to a July 1st date. I think uh, having a, a hard and fast uh, uh, date is a good thing, but I'm just saying that it makes it difficult in the provinces when you're looking at um, the, the, the fact that you're responsible for distribution. I also think, by the way, that uh, 36 and 37 are a little unnecessary if you, if you actually sending distribution for the provinces, why are you then reeling back in some of the ability of the, of the provinces to, to decide how they're going to distribute? I mean, you're giving them the responsibility on one hand and then taking it back from them. I think we're at provincial distribution. Is that what's on the, on the screen? Good. Um, so September 8th, as the Chancellor mentioned, uh, Ontario confirmed that they're going to have a Crown Corporation, a retail model. They're going to have both online and storefront. They plan to have 60 stores to be opened in the first year and 150 stores open by 2020. Um, uh, the, the problem is not with the number of stores, it's the way that they have described they're going to be set up. This is a return to the 1950s style. Uh, and there's not a lot of people in here who will remember the 1950s, but if you do, it is a 1950s style of distribution where you'll essentially go through a door, walk up to a wicket, you'll ask for something, somebody will go into the back, they'll get it, they'll bring it out. Um, in all likelihood, a very poor uh, customer experience. Um, uh, there may be... Uh, there may be uh, <laughs> There may, be I, there may be iPads or something that you can kind of peruse through, but uh, it's, yeah, but it's, yeah, all in all, um, uh, I, 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 my hope is that they will move away from this uh, as they get closer to the actual distribution date. On September 14th, New Brunswick announced the Crown Corporation uh, for the province supply agreements. Really, really, really important. I'm going to talk about the supply gap if I have enough time. This is going to be a real problem. I'm told I have three minutes now. Okay, uh, I'm going to move on to the next, um, the next uh, slide. I just want to go through this really briefly. You probably all can imagine what the possible distribution options are going to be. Um, they're going to be different depending on the province that you're in. BC has had a, a, a very long-standing um, uh, and well-recognized uh, dispensary community. Um, in other parts of the, of the country, you're going to, you're going to see uh, a mix of crown corporations, maybe with some private retail, depending on where you are in the country. It, it, it will, uh, when the legislation was originally brought in, it was brought in to say it should respond to kind of the, the local 
uh, considerations uh, in the provinces and, and the distribution model will do that. Uh, my question is, well, there will be a, there will almost all certainly be an online uh, component to any distribution profile. Um, you know, 80% of Canadians buy online. Uh, it's the process that already works uh, in, under the existing regulations. There's no reason for that not to happen. The, will local licensed producers be able to do uh, sales at their at their at their individual facilities? That's a question that I think is still open and live. Uh, I believe that the distribution chain is actually an opportunity for innovation, and that there are lots of things that that the province can do. Um, you, you, know, I know, you know, there's a discussion going on about cafes and and. Uh, and lounges, those you know, those have to do um, with the actual ability to, um, in fact, use a say a product which the government has decided you're able to have. If, you, if you're in an apartment building and the apartment building says you cannot use it there and it's prohibited for use in public, then where do you use it? There has to be a, a, an alternative for that. Uh, I'm uh, so. Have I got to the last slide? Challenges, is that what's up there? Good. Supply gap, big challenge. So the Parliamentary Budget Office has said that, um, there, that the demand for, uh, for cannabis in this country will be about 650,000 uh, kilograms. The capacity of the licensed producers to produce in 2017 when this goes live is about 80,000 kilograms. So the, 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 the difference is immense. Uh, Mackey Research that does research for investors says that in fact the, um, uh, the, um, the uh, market is actually 800,000 kilograms uh, but he said, but they say that the ability of the licensed producers is about 100,000. Either way you slice it, there's a huge supply gap that won't be remedied uh, by the licensed producers probably until about 2020. So there's a problem. Marketing and branding restrictions. You're going to have an undifferentiated product competing with a supply chain that is already well developed, that is low cost, um, and uh, and is efficient. Uh, and if you have very restrictive marketing and branding issues, it's very difficult for local producers or uh, licensed producers to be able to compete with that uh, supply chain. Sections 36 and 37 I already mentioned. Um, uh, you can ask me about dispensing technology. I'm happy to talk about it, but I won't right now. Uh, price, including uh, uh, taxation, obviously a big issue. As I've mentioned, you've got to compete with a supply chain that's already in place. There's a rule in economics that says the lowest cost supply chain usually wins. So whatever the price is that you intend to reach at some point in time, it better be able to compete effectively with the already existing low cost supply chain. Uh, employee training. This is an issue. Um, uh, consumer experience I mentioned. Um, uh, preparing for the edibles market. There is already, folks, and some of you will know this, a well-defined um, edibles marketplace. You could go online at this very moment. Uh, if you buy more than 200 bucks worth of stuff, shipping is free. They'll send it by Canada Post. <laughs> You know, so the competition in the edibles market is uh, is going to be uh, is going to be um, uh, something that's going to have to be dealt with. I put municipal consultations up there. Somebody's got to consult with the municipalities about where, if you're going to have bricks and mortar, where they are going to be located. Every time I look at the list of challenges, I could easily put six more things on here, including the rights of employees working in locations to, to uh, have uh, occupational health and uh, safety standards, um, if you're going to have lounges and cafes. So there are just, every time you think about this, it's a bigger uh, set of challenges. Can we get ready? Of course we can, and we should, but I'm, I'm just saying there is, there, there is plenty of work to do between now and July 1st. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, my colleague Camille uh, for uh, organizing this event. And I see my colleague uh, Frank Harvey, Dean of so the Social Sciences, in the room here. Uh, be being here make us very happy. I think it's our role as a public institution to engage with community on, 
on very important topics, uh, Trump, now <laughs> cannabis, and uh, yeah, th things are, pieces are moving as we speak right now, so it's quite exciting. And frankly, uh, I've learned a great deal tonight so far, because I'm, I'm not a cannabis expert, just so you know. Uh, my area of research is food distribution and policy, so I look at everything that can disrupt the efficiency of, of food from far, farm to fork and from fork to farm. And that's why I got into the cannabis issue, really. Um, a, a reporter about a year ago told me, you can order edibles online. And I didn't believe her. And I did order online, and I got the products, <laughs> as you said. <laughs> it's, my God, this is, and there's no regulatory framework on this. I, I'm not a cannabis expert, so I have no idea what the quality of the product is. Obviously, I didn't, I didn't consume it, so don't, but uh, I was intrigued. Six months later, I had a venture capitalist coming to my office, someone with capacity, and told me, Sylvain, I want you to look into the edibles. I said, why? I think there's lots of potential there to sell edibles once cannabis is legalized in Canada. Really? Then it planted a seed in my head, no pun, uh, and then a few, a few weeks later, we got this idea of this panel, and that's why we needed, we needed to go out there and, and assess the situation. How Canadians are feeling about cannabis. Are we ready? Are we getting ready? And that's, that's the kind of question we, we gave ourselves. And to make things even more interesting, I was invited by, by, um, by Loblaw in Toronto a few months ago to sit down with... Uh, quite a few known chefs, uh, chefs running restaurants, re restaurant operators, and we were all asked to, to signal, signal the top food trends over the next 10 years. Every single chef in the room had cannabis on that list. Every sing so it's not just about food retailing, it's about food service as well, and, and the food service in the industry is the $80 billion business, food retailing is worth $120 billion is in this country. Just a few days ago, Metro acquired Jean Coutu for $4.5 billion. Loblaws purchased Shoppers a few years ago. As you talk to grocers, you see that there's a strategy. I'm not saying that, that the cannabis issue is pushing these companies to invest billions of dollars in, the far, in, 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 pharmacy, in pharmacy outlets. But all I'm saying is that it is in the back of their heads moving forward, growing the business. Um, so we went out and assessed Canadians. And frankly, what we found out was very interesting. The results were published all around Canada last week. It was in most newspapers in the country. In fact, uh, this week, uh, the report is being published in many newspapers in the US right now. And I've been receiving, we've been receiving phone calls from Colorado, Washington states, asking us, how did you, how, how did, how were you able to conduct this study? You're a university. And I have to tell you, right now, I'm very proud to be a professor at Dalhousie, because Dalhousie allowed us to really assess the situation on edibles. In the U.S. right now, there are 60 million consumers who have access to edibles right now, and there's little research. There's lots of research on the public health side, but on edibles and on consumption side, which is my side, there's, there's little of it. We don't know what's going on in people's heads, how people are reacting, are people engaging, are people assessing risk for themselves, their loved ones, friends. There's a lot of, it's quite unclear. I, I personally think that the stigma of the legalization of cannabis is fueling the confusion out there. And when we looked at the results of our survey, we realized that Can Canadians are, mo the majority of Canadians are favorable to the legalization of cannabis, but there's, it, there is a lot of confusion out there. And that's why I'm very happy to do these, to, to be part of this event, because this is about informing, this is about getting better educated uh, about, about this important issue. 
So I'll give you a few results that we found out if you didn't know. So we asked Canadians, are you in favor of the legalization of cannabis? So 68% of Canadians are in favor of the legalization of cannabis. So the majority. It's consistent with other surveys, other surveys we've seen on this issue in the past. But out of 68%, 93% would be willing to try a edible product, a cannabis-infused food product. The temptation is there. But C45 doesn't really explicitly include edibles, although Daryl just told me that it may, may be included with an amendment going on right now, which I think would be good news. Now, in terms of concerns, and it was, we talked about health, uh, the impact on health. 58% of Canadians are concerned about the health of children and young adults. And let me tell you, as dean, I don't know how you feel, Camille, but as dean of one of the largest faculties on campus, I actually think that alcohol makes things complicated enough. I'm not sure if marijuana will make things easier for us. Uh, so if I'm concerned, certainly, and the research shows that we should be. So the majority of Canadians are concerned. Here's a bit of a paradox for you, looking at different regions from around the country. So if I ask you which province is most favorable to the legalization of cannabis, what would you say? BC, right? Yeah. So if you said BC, you're correct. Now I'm going to ask you this question. Which province do you think is most concerned about the health of children and young adults? Quebec. BC. Oh. I, know, I was going to say Quebec too. <laughs> it's my own province. So I think it speaks to how educated BC may be. This is just speculating, but BC is, is very liberal. Uh, there's, there's a different feel there. I suspect that they know what, what, what this means to them. So that was very interesting. Now we asked a question about cooking. Would you cook with cannabis at home? 19.5% of Canadians would. Now the reason why that percentage so low is that most people just wouldn't know what to do with cannabis. They would be concerned about dosage. How, how, how would you manage cannabis as an ingredient? So there were lots of uncertainties around there. Perhaps we should have a discussion. If, it, if we are to make this thing legal and we are selling through the LCBO or a crown of the LCBO or in New Brunswick, if we are to sell this product and people go home with it, what is going to happen? So there's a huge void, educational void there that we found out. Restaurants, we asked Canadians, would you order a dish, spaghetti with sauce with, you know, <laughs> some sprinkle on it? 38.5% <laughs> of Canadians would be willing to order a dish with cannabis in it. Now, asking them if they would substitute their alcoholic drink for cannabis, 29% of Canadians said yes. So they're still, this, they know, they understand the implications of alcohol, they understand what alcohol does to their bodies, but marijuana is still unknown. And frankly, I think most people in this room would, would agree with that. Is cannabis considered as a healthy ingredient? 12.6%. So it's not seen as something, because we're in this era of functional foods, uh, especially boomers looking for health benefits in their food, cannabis may not be it for manufacturers. And that's why we asked that question. So that was an interesting result. But let's look at the Atlantic region for just a second, since we are in the Atlantic region here, asking people, are they favorable to cannabis? And the answer is 51%. The Atlantic region is highly divided on this issue. We have to accept that. And so, and the majority of people living in the Atlantic region are concerned about the health of children and young adults as well. So there's the, I think there's lots to learn about cannabis uh, from, from a food distribution point of view, because that's the area I know very well. 
But when, I've, uh, when I spoke to some, some university uh, professors out in Colorado and Washington State over so the last few weeks, uh, one person told me something I, I, I will remember, and he said, listen, we, we didn't do everything right, as Anne mentioned, I think we need to give ourselves a chance and do things right, and I agree with that. Uh, but he said one thing that really stuck with me. If we are to legalize cannabis in this country, regardless if we agree with the policy or not, we have to befriend it. We have to accept it to do it right, to adopt a comprehensive policy around the legalization of cannabis and edibles as well. Because, as Daryl said, edibles are out there already. So we should protect ourselves or make sure that we do protect ourselves knowing uh, that this product is already out there. That's something, that's a message that really stuck with me. And so my message to you looking at edibles, I think it's, it's a tremendous opportunity for, for the food industry and they see that, clearly see that. But at the same time, I believe as a society we need to do our job to make sure that this is done the right way. Thank you. So I'm the last speaker on this, this panel. Um, so I'll try and keep my remarks relatively brief because I know that there are questions that we, we need to take. So my name's Melanie Kelly and I'm a professor in pharmacology. And I work in the area of translational pharmacology, so preclinical work on the medical benefits or therapeutic benefits of cannabis. Um, I work a lot with Dr. Eileen Denovan Wright, and I'm involved in developing novel cannabinoid therapeutics that are useful for pain and inflammation. So I've been given the job of talking about medical access uh, to cannabis, and uh, I'm going to try and frame my remarks to keep them relatively brief uh, under... Um, a couple of uh, questions. Where are we now? Uh, are we ready um, and prepared? And what can we do to improve access um, the way it currently stands? But I'll, I'll just preface this by saying that Dr. Denovan Wright uh, mentioned the endocannabinoid system. Um, and although a lot of the research is relatively new, what we do know is, is that this is a very important system. It controls many uh, basic biological functions, pain, the immune system, our cardiovascular system, our brain. So there's a lot of um, possibility in ingesting compounds that act on this system that we can affect uh, these particular functions in a negative way. But the opportunities to modulate this system for the benefit of Canadians and, and, and globally for health is immense at this time. And what most people don't realize is that there is a huge body of preclinical evidence that supports the therapeutic use of cannabis and its constituent cannabinoids, the compounds that are in the plant. So there's a lot of interest in moving forward in developing good cannabis-based therapeutics. Um, but how are we gonna do that? So right now, cannabis is not an approved drug in Canada. It hasn't met the standards for the Food and Drug Administration. Um, and those standards um, would result in a notice of compliance and a drug identification number. And that's what you'll see on most of the drugs that you buy. So most Canadians um, who are accessing medical cannabis are getting it under the Access to Cannabis for Medical Purposes regulations. So it just provides a method that the courts have mandated that they can legally obtain medical cannabis for their needs. So what's going to happen after legalization? Well, the task force, and I want to thank Anne McClellan and the many uh, other members on the task force, I mean, this was a heroic effort, really, in providing really thoughtful and useful recommendations to the government. Um, they've recommended that the ACMPR, or the Access to Cannabis for Medical Purposes regulations, continue, um, which I believe is a very important step um, for patients who are accessing cannabis uh, un under the ACMPR. Um, and what this means for patients um, is that they need a recommendation if they want to receive medical cannabis, which they get from their doctor. Not a prescription, a recommendation. 
Um, and then they can obtain it directly from licensed producers. Uh, and as Daryl Dex just pointed out, there's various methods, but it's by mail, it's delivered, um, and you order online or you speak to someone at a licensed producer. Um, also, patients can register directly with Health Canada uh, to grow their own uh, cannabis, and this is based on the recommended amounts from their healthcare provider. Um, they can also stipulate someone to grow uh, cannabis plants for them, and this is something that the task force is hoping will not continue or has recommended that be looked at and possibly not continued uh, as we move forward after legalization. So just to remind Canadians that in addition to medical cannabis, it's essentially a plant that has many different constituents, which always makes it difficult to follow the traditional drug route. We have availability already to prescription cannabinoids through healthcare providers. Um, but to date, you know, even for prescription cannabinoids, they're not readily uh, prescribed for Canadians, largely due uh, to um, the lack of education among the healthcare community in terms of the endocannabinoid system. So where are we now? We have the ACMPR uh, for Canadians who are currently using medical cannabis. We have prescription drugs. Uh, we are moving forward. Um, currently, Canadians are using medical cannabis for a number of indications. Uh, the largest one is pain. For example, neuropathic pain, chronic pain conditions. Um, Canadians are also using it for uh, spasticity and pain in, in multiple sclerosis conditions, um, for nausea and vomiting. It's been uh, prescription cannabinoids are approved for that, and patients are also looking to use cannabis for that, particularly for chemotherapy. Um, mood disorders, this is uh, something that many Canadians are accessing cannabis for, and mood disorders that involve things like anxiety and sleep disturbances such as PTSD or post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, also for inflammatory diseases of the GI tract, the bowel, uh, Crohn's disease, etc., and neurological disorders such as Tourette's syndrome, uh, patients are using cannabis, medical cannabis for that, as well as prescription cannabinoids. And I just want to point out at this point is we have um, only moderate evidence for several of these indications, such as chronic pain. We significantly lack good clinical evidence in many of these cases. So are we ready for legalization? And should we continue to maintain a separate medical stream for cannabis? I mean, that's something I've been hearing talked about a lot. I think that patients are very concerned that a medical stream is, is maintained, and the task force has recommended that this continues for the next five years, and we reassess that at that time. So why should we maintain a separate medical framework? Um, well, I think that there is a big difference between recreational non-medical use and medical use. We need to support patients as well as healthcare providers as we move forward. I mean, patients experience a lot of stigma, even visiting their doctor and requesting medical cannabis. So that's an issue that needs, could be um, exacerbated if we move away from recognizing a separate medical access uh, for cannabis. Um, we need incentives. I mean, we're not going to develop better products if we don't incentivize uh, medical cannabis um, in ter for, for things like pharmaceutical companies. If there isn't a separate medical stream, and it's simply uh, one stream after legalization, it'll be difficult to convince pharmaceutical companies to move down the line of developing drug identification number products. And that'll be important uh, to try and get better therapeutics. So there's a lot of reasons for that. Access for patients, uh, Daryl Dexter's already identified that there's going to be a big, possibly, a potentially large supply gap. I think many uh, patients who are using medical cannabis are extremely concerned about this. They're concerned about access to specific varietals or chemovars of cannabis. I mean, Dr. Denovan Wright pointed out that cannabis um, is more than just THC um, or the main psychoactive ingredient that recreational users are seeking. It contains lots of other different cannabinoids, and some of those have already shown good evidence of therapeutic benefit and many patients want specific varieties that may have more of those types of cannabinoids in. So we want to ensure that they can have access to the type of cannabis that they need. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is uh, reimbursement or cost. 
For many patients, medical cannabis and as well as pharmaceutical drugs are a huge significant burden. The task force has recommended that medical cannabis will not be taxed differently from recreational. But right now, Canadians can, can receive prescription drugs and don't pay GST. I would suggest that it would be useful to consider uh, looking at the different structure for how um, medical cannabis is funded or whether or not we can develop better products with drug identification numbers that would be accessible for insurance coverage. And in Nova Scotia alone, there was a recent case that has been debated here um, uh, in the courts um, about medical insurance coverage of cannabis. So these are all issues that are up in the air right now that uh, we need to think about with respect to patients, uh, where they are burdened by the costs of their medication. Some of the, the things that we need to, to think about by maintaining a strong medical stream for cannabis and for cannabinoids is what can we do to make it better in the future? And that's what I think I'd, I'd want to end on by stressing uh, that the task force outlined very strongly a recommendation for more research and more education. And this is education not just focused on the consumer or the medical patient, but also education for healthcare providers, uh, both for doctors and for pharmacists. I mean, right now, the endocannabinoid system is not a formal part of medical training. It's not a formal part of pharmacist training. Um, some people teach it, sometimes they don't. Most doctors are very uncomfortable with talking about medical cannabis with their patients. And they're also very uncomfortable recommending it. They don't know what dose they should recommend, what type of product, uh, what it's going to be best for. So we need to support uh, both patients and also healthcare providers by providing that information that will lead to better education. We need to educate within the medical school about the endocannabinoid system. We need to understand better about the plant so we can help licensed producers and other people working in that field so we produce better strains uh, that meet patients' needs. Um, and we also need to think about cannabis therapeutics. How are we delivering it? Can we deliver it better? So for instance, smoking is something you certainly wouldn't want to advocate for your patients. But there are already an uh, increase in, within the industry in very innovative ways of delivering cannabis in a more dose-standardized method. And so these are things that we should be encouraging. And by maintaining a medical stream, we will incentivize the industry to continue to progress along those lines, which is really important for patients. It gives them far more choice as we move forward for the future. Um, Besides education and training and, and understanding the needs of patients, uh, we really need knowledge transfer. What's really the point in generating all this new information when we don't share it properly across all the different stakeholders that are involved in this? How do we communicate to patients new, new research? Uh, how do we communicate to doctors about how they should be prescribing if it becomes a prescription? Um, right now it's a recommendation. Um, how do we communicate with other scientists so that we know what's going on and we can, make, we can get together and collaborate to actually make a stronger uh, system? So these are the things that, that, we're, uh, that are being considered at the moment in terms of medical uh, cannabis and cannabinoids. But how's all this going to be funded? Um, that still isn't entirely clear. I mean, I would suggest it would not be inappropriate for the government to transfer or to set aside some of the revenue from taxing uh, non-medical cannabis towards research that goes towards the therapeutic benefits of cannabis. Um, focused funding from the federal in institutes such as the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. These are all areas that need to be explored and definitely uh, I would hope that you as consumers um, in term, either from, from the point of view as me of medical cannabis, but also recreational will demand uh, these kinds of research initiatives uh, from the government as we move forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. This is one of the best behaved panels I've ever been involved with. <laughs> They've oh, scared. <laughs> so far, true enough. Yeah. They've stayed to the time very nicely. Um, when we assembled this group and when we were thinking about how best to present this panel, we wanted to get a group of experts who would combine um, their own 
learning and knowledge with identifying issues and ways forward. And I think they've really done a very good job. So let's give them, all of them, some applause. We have set up microphones and we've uh, reserved time for questions. So don't be shy. If you have any questions that you'd like to address to the panel, please uh, come up to a mic. You can address it to a specific person or you can ask it generally and the panel can fight over who's going to um, take the question. And I think this person here, this woman, yes? Go ahead, ask your question. Is this one on? Is it on? Yeah, yeah? okay. <laughs> Um, first, uh, just a comment and then a question, a quick comment. As you were talking about edibles, all I could visualize was going to the movie theater and putting butter on my popcorn. <laughs> 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 Having choices, you know? Um, but <laughs> my, my question uh, is right now we, we are um, restricted to uh, moving alcohol across provinces. So I'm wondering if any consideration is given to uh, people sort of it, shopping interprovincially, you know, uh, on, for a met, for a cannabis, and moving it. Uh, the answer Darren. to that is yes. Um, the so um, if you if you use online technology and you're going to shop online, so you want to buy something from a licensed producer in British Columbia, if you use online technology. It uses geofencing, so it can tell it can the technology can actually tell exactly where you're ordering from, and that's important because that's the provincial tax you'll pay, and um, and it will um, it will prompt you on a series of security questions in order to determine your your age. Um, this is. This is technology that uh, now is already being used, uh, for example, in the online gambling industry. It's, it's um, uh, considered um, quite secure uh, from a payment perspective. So um, the, the, the great thing for the various provinces is it can generate reports very quickly in terms of the amount that's being bought, the tax revenue that's coming in. It's all, that's why it's very likely that online um, as I said, online purchasing will be part of any kind of uh, uh, distribution profile for provinces. But I think, Daryl, correct me if I'm wrong, if you look at the Ontario uh, scheme that's been proposed, you uh, are only going to be able to purchase online from their retailers. Right. So what they're doing is they're putting online in, but you got to go through their portal right. to purchase. That's right. But what can you purchase? Can you purchase you can, from Tilray and on as, Vancouver as I understand Island? it, you'll be able to purchase from any licensed producer. Hmm. Now, uh, okay, that, I wasn't that, clear about that. That, last that, bit. that assumes that that assumes that the that the that they are going to list all as on their product list yeah. all of the, the licensed producers. producers. Thank you. All right. Yep. Okay. Um, if anyone wants me to come to them, just give me a wave and I will come to you. <laughs> okay, next I think is this gentleman with the blue shirt. Yes, at this microphone. You're, sure. you're next and then we'll come over here. Sure, yeah. My name is Evan Price. Um, I happen to be uh, a president of the Truro Herbal Company, which is uh, one of the licensed producer applicants from Truro. Um, it's good to be back in the McGinnis room. I'm uh, a Dow alum and uh, <laughs> while, I, while I was here, I was also vice president of the student union for finance. So. Um, <laughs> The, uh, one of the, I guess, the, the biggest area that I'm concerned with, uh, why I get into this, is around the supply gap. So, um, as Daryl mentioned, uh, that there are, it's like 10, 20 percent, if you add up all the, the space that could produce today or even over the next year, uh, that there will be maybe 10 to 20 percent of patients and consumers uh, under legalization that will be, their demand will be met. So my question would be is that obviously my product's all going to be sold, so that's that's not an issue, but I'm worried about the 80% of people that won't be able to find product. And is the the reaction from government going to be to trade uh, like licensed producer quality for some form of availability? And I'm interested to hear what, what the provincial and federal governments think that they can do to influence either. Who would like to take that question? Well, I think the answer to the question is no around the sacrifice of quality. Um, 
What I would say is that the government of Canada, as far as I know, is obviously they're looking very closely at the supply-demand curves, and they have estimates. Uh, they're more or less, I think, in line with that which you heard from Daryl. What is interesting is if you look in the United States in the first year after legalization, only 25% of consumers actually bought from the legal market, right? So when you think about uh, supply issues, and we want to encourage everybody to buy from the legal market, obviously, but you do have to be practical about what is going to happen in that first year. And it has taken states like Colorado and Washington more than a year to get significant numbers of people moving from the illegal market to the legal supply market. So while that is likely to be the supply, de uh, the demand in and around that 650,000 that, that Daryl mentioned, um, how that is met I think is going to be an interesting question. Um, and the other thing I would say is licensed producers are ramping up uh, very quickly in anticipation of July. For example, Aurora, where I live in Alberta, is going to produce the equivalent of 19 Canadian football fields. I found it interesting they specified Canadian football fields, but there's a reason for that. 19 Canadian football fields worth of cannabis when they're fully up and running. Now, that's going to take a little bit of time. Uh, you're also going to have big quality control issues with uh, production facilities that large. And some of the people I talk to are a little concerned. They're not clear that quality control is going to be that easy to maintain uh, in production facilities that large. So all that to say that I think your question is a good one. And uh, we have a lot to learn around the supply demand, the actual supply and demand that happens as of July 1st, 18. Um, and as with everything else, this is going to be a work in progress. We're going to learn. Other thing I should say is probably the federal government is considering whether or not they'll let importation if that demand curve is way out mm. of sync. Mm. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. To this person. Thank you, panel and um, Dean Cameron. So I'm sitting here and I feel like I'm in a twilight zone. <laughs> In a twilight, I, I think it's good that it's been legalized. Um, in a twilight zone, because as a black Canadian, my community has borne the brunt of this war on drugs. And I believe, um, Chancellor McClellan, you were a minister at the time when the war on drugs was happening. African Canadian people, especially young men, have been jailed, have been criminalized, because of carrying, mar and I'll say the word marijuana, marijuana spliff. So for example, I was in Ontario three weeks ago, and I was talking to one of my young neighbors. He's 25 years old, he's a black man, and I live in Nova Scotia now, so he was happy to see me, and he said, you know, I'm thinking of leaving Canada. I said, why? He said, I can't get a job. I have a conviction, I have marijuana convictions, and everywhere I go, I'm, you know, I'm blocked. He has automotive skills. His parents want to set him up to go to a country overseas to open a garage so he can have a future. One social scientist called this um, situation th that these people experience as citizens minus. They are citizens minus. And my heart is breaking because thousands of people from my community can't find work, are unemployable because of the war on drugs that has decimated my community, marijuana for marijuana possession, and now I see it's been legalized and my community is being left behind. So I'm saying there needs to be reparation. So I, that for that people like that young man, people, like that young man who can't find a who is a citizen minus in this country, must be given a grant so he can set up a distribution center, so he can gather around young men around him and they put on a suit and they can go and grow the thing because it's now gonna be legal and get a future. Okay, I'm going so, to- So, so th th one more thing, Dean Cameron. Yeah. I'm, 
asking the people, especially the people from government, like Mr. Dexter and Chancellor McClellan, if there is going to be a forgiveness practice in this. Because Jamaica, for example, which is set to um, not legalize, they're still afraid of the United States, but decriminalize, has taken the records of thousands of people and have wiped them clean. Because the, the, the conviction has affected people's employability. So I'm saying the African Canadian community, which has been dealt with in the United Nations Human Rights Commission, which by the way came out last week, is now online, you can read it. The African Canadian community is once again penalized by the legalization because my community does not have the money to set up these shops and things that are going to go up. So there's a I, lot. There's a lot here, so, and there's several questions. I, I know. I know, Camille. Yeah. I know. But my community is one of the communities. Our second speaker talked about the racialization of the exactly. and so the conviction. I'd like to get them now yes, to respond, if you. I could. And um, um, I think Archie, do you have a th something to say about the forgiveness issue? And uh, well, I. I'm all in favor of forgiveness yeah. <laughs> uh, in general, but uh, in particular, I, I certainly am enthusiastically supportive of providing pardons for persons who have been convicted uh, of uh, crimes in the past, as the law then was, uh, that are no longer offenses. Government can, I would say, easily do this. The legal tools are available. I think, for example, in the United Kingdom, uh, that in 2017, the UK Justice Minister um, issued posthumous pardons for thousands of gay men who were convicted of uh, having sex you know, with same-sex partners uh, decades before. Uh, so it was a comprehensive pardon in similar circumstances where the law had changed. And fortunately, um, you know, attitudes had liberalized. Um, so there, there are examples of government taking uh, either executive action or legislative action to do exactly uh, what the, the questioner was suggesting. And I think that there's an excellent case for it, uh, and uh, I believe that Canadians would be supportive of uh, such a, a move. I don't know that the government has made any commitment in that regard yet, but uh, on the other hand, I haven't heard hostility towards it by any means from government spokespersons. So I think you've raised an excellent issue, and I think the answer has to be yes. Yep. I think Mr. Trudeau, in response, Mr. Trudeau was asked by Vice Television a few months ago when he appeared there with PS Parliamentary Secretary Bill Blair uh, as to the question of pardons. And as Archie said, the Prime Minister said no decision will has been made, but that it is something that they will look at after legalization. So I think very much the door is open, and I know that the three ministers involved in this file are very much seized with the fact, and we heard as a task force as we traveled across the country, much discussion. It was outside our mandate, but certainly much discussion around the possibility of uh, uh, pardon. And as I say, I, my sense is that it is an issue that Mr. Trudeau will return to. Okay, thank you. Um, this gentleman over here has been standing there patiently. Next. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alec Frith. I was a, I've been a medical marijuana user since about 12 for Hep C that I re received in the Tainted Blood scandal. Uh, I've watched. I'm really happy to be part of this because I've watched this uh, this topic very closely my whole life, and it, it was one of the first kind of inklings of disinformation that I had as a young teenager of something that I've been being lied to. And I think my question kind of combines the last two questions, one about the supply gap and the other one about kind of re reconciling with a generation of people who were so brave and self-informed and well-informed to be fighting for this thing that is now being recognized on a societal level, but they are now fighting in order to get over the criminalization they've been, they've been dealt uh, through their whole, whole life fighting for the, such a wonderful thing. And when we talk about reconciling that after legalization, I think a lot of the issue for me is these people are being kind of 
after all their bravery and sacrifice, being slowly marginalized out of the thing as large corporate uh, entities will slowly take over this thing that people have, in the grassroots have been fighting for, for so long. So how do we reconcile uh, all this talk about supply gap when we have the supply chain, low cost supply chain that we talk about competing with, when it's really not, it's not criminal entities, it's wonderful people that have been fighting to try to give medicine to their friends and their family uh, for so long. How do we kind of reconcile that moral, uh, I don't know, it just seems morally kind of shady uh, in a way to talk in certain terms about this and not uh, address that. Anybody want to tackle that one? Uh, everybody's looking at me. Well, I, I guess what I would say is, as I referenced in my opening remarks, um, there is an illegal market, and we in the task force separated out organized crime from those who are growing. Unless you're a licensed producer in this country, you are illegal and will be up until July some to, uh, of 18. But it is really, if, um, unless you're medicinal, if you're medicinal, that's fine. That's, I'm not talking about medicinal, I'm talking about the new adult market. Um, and there are lots of growers out there who have been growing, and we distinguish them from organized crime, who are growing, for example, in the Okanagan, who go to the market every Saturday morning, the RCMP turn a blind eye, they sell to their neighbors and friends, right? Mm -hmm. We want those people in the legal system. We do not want them outside. I have also gone on public record as saying that I do not believe a conviction for something like personal possession should in fact exclude those people from being able to apply and all other things being equal be allowed to come inside the market. We need that expertise. We need uh, the, in some cases, decades long experience with genetics, with strains. Of all sorts of things. So you, you raise an important point, and we hope that as many of those growers as possible come into and are able to come into the legal regime. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. This gentleman here. My name is Chris Enns, and I'm the owner of the Pharmacist Medical Cannabis Resource Center, the first brick and mortar storefront dispensary here in Nova Scotia. And, <laughs> and Ultimately, the first uh, medical cannabis dispensary that was raided in Nova Scotia under Daryl Dexter's regime. Um, that being said, I think there's a great opportunity to make amends here. And, uh, I think there's a great opportunity to make amends here, and I want to express my gratefulness to the whole panel today. Uh, I was an honor student at Dalhousie uh, studying immunology and microbiology. I was the president of the Microbiology and Immunology Society, and I was very passionate since a young child about going to medical school. I actually moved here from Ontario because I was so encouraged by the, the quality of education I'd heard that Dow Medical offered. But in my fourth year of education, I discovered the endocannabinoid system, and I became confused about why it wasn't in my textbooks, why none of my professors were talking about it. And when I tried to engage my professors about this very topic in a very one-on-one -on -one, uh, personal format, there was an unwillingness to even acknowledge that there was an endocannabinoid receptor system. In fact, I couldn't find a single one of my receptor uh, of professors who would engage any sort of dialogue about the cannabinoid receptor system, and I was told I was a, a stoner out there in left field, even though I had A's throughout university. It was at that moment, my very last uh, week of fourth year, that I dropped out of my, of my education here at Dow. I didn't finish my exams, and I planted my first seeds. And, uh, And the point of planting those seeds was that I hoped <laughs> that I could turn cannabis flowers into extracts. <laughs> My hope was that I could turn cannabis flowers into extracts and provide them free of charge to cancer patients throughout the province who had become licensed by their doctors to use medical cannabis. Because so many cancer patients are at a fragile time in their life where they can't afford this medicine. And if there's someone telling them that this medicine is going to cost them something, and intelligently telling them that they need to increase their dose, they need to get up to a gram or two of oil extracts per day before the medical literature really shows that this isn't just good for nausea, this isn't just good for symptom relief, but for things like cancer, for some people, this can even put the brakes on the development of that tumor. And unless that this medicine was going to be free for those individuals so that we could provide them a proper education and then provide them the medicine without there being that tick of financial incentive 
uh, of there being a reason why I'm telling you to use this medicine because I'm going to benefit financially myself. Uh, I, I felt that model needed to be out there. Rick Simpson was an early uh, inspiration in that respect. And I think over the past 12 years, we've done a good job of, of advancing that program. But I have a lot of fear right now. Um, there's a separation between medical and recreational cannabis, uh, a dialogue that's ensuing when really the medical literature is very clear that cancer rates and dementia rates are exponentially lower in those who are chronic cannabis consumers. And I'd be happy to share that medical literature from mainstream medical journals with anyone that wanted to uh, engage or dialogue about the, that after today. And so my question is specifically for Mr. Daryl Dexter. Mr. Dexter, I've reached out to you and I've asked you on behalf of the Nova Scotia Association of Medical Cannabis Dispensaries to please, please work with us and help us to continue making available to our patients the very medicines that they are so desperate for. Please do not only offer your services to licensed producers who have very deep pockets who are only here to profit off the medicine we also have cash for you we have whole duffel bags of cash for you for real no like as much cash as you want please help the private and licensed designated growers of Nova Scotia under the medical regime and the current medical cannabis dispensaries who are specifically helping licensed medical patients, please help us onboard into the new regime. Please help us continue to help those. So we've got the question. Yeah. We've got the question. Thanks a lot. I'll turn it over to the panel. Will now. you work with us? That's I will say as a point of order, I don't think I'd make admissions about having duffel bags full of yeah, cash. Really. <laughs> Well, that, that started out as a scientific question, and then yeah. somewhere it went in a different direction. But, uh, you know, first of all, I work, uh, I work for a government relations public affairs firm. We represent a, uh, not just licensed producers. We represent people right throughout the, the distribution uh, chain, people who are interested in it. And, uh, but I work within, uh, you know, within a, a, a regime where I have to consider every one of the the potential conflicts within that. So, as I mentioned to you, I would consider, uh, I would consider uh, the case that you made when we spoke on the phone, uh, and um, and we'll just have to go from there. I, I I can't give you a definitive answer, but I would like to hear a definitive answer on the scientific question that yep. you had posed, yeah. which is where it started. So I'll turn it over to one of our other oh, panelists. Well, I, what was your name again? What, yeah, you obviously didn't take either Eileen or my class at Dalhousie, um, because we definitely were talking about endocannabinoids. Yes. Um, so the scientific question was, what was it in the end there? Scientific literature. Um, Okay, so the scientific literature isn't evident. Um, it's not to say that there are, the medical benefits don't exist, for sure. There's extensive research in the preclinical area that it does. The issue right now is not patient-reported um, evidence of efficacy, because that's definitely there as well. We lack the large controlled clinical trials that are needed really um, for the authorization or for, to really look at the question of whether something has benefit within the medical, uh, under the medical context. So for instance, areas like cancer, we just don't have enough science, uh, clinical data at this current time to make that statement. So for instance, it could well be, exactly as you say, uh, that is unequivocal. But right now, there may be only uh, three or four trials that meet the standards. So for example, in the area of pain, we have moderate to relatively good chronic pain, at least data right now. So eventually, the statement that you've made may actually be true with respect to uh, the data that's going to fall out of the trials that will hopefully be carried out. But we need to, to promote those trials. We need to put money there and make that so, so that the evidence that, you're, that you yeah. so, so much claim is, is out there, it's published, it's accepted within the medical community. Um, and that, that is an essential thing that we're lacking for many different indications right now. Yeah. Eileen, anything to add to that, or does that do it? No, I would just reinforce that, that I know that there's very many people that are highly enthusiastic, and you know, our evidence cannot be anecdotal. It needs to be 
carefully controlled, and we need to understand for every drug the risk and the benefit. And while I will give you that there are very many people that believe that cannabis may be the cure from everything from heartache to hemorrhoids, we don't have the evidence. You know, we have to be careful of what we say because that will normalize things to thinking that we can, we can use case reports when we need good m medical evidence. And I think that what we're asking for is that we don't forget that there are medical uses, that we do know that some of the uses that people are using it for may be beneficial in the short term, but they may not be beneficial long term, and we have to be cautious. It's a very powerful drug with very many different components that are in combination, and the strength of it is getting stronger as the plants develop, so we have to be careful. It's a drug that has potential for both harm and benefit, as do all drugs. Thank you. This gentleman here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Brendan Ahern. I'm a student at the King School of Journalism. Uh, I just have a question. Um, last summer, I think Karen Casey said, or Minister Casey said that there will be public consultations held on the legalization of, um, of cannabis uh, this fall. Just wondering when those consultations will be and if they'll be in a forum like this or in a more online poll or forum. You might have to ask Karen Casey, but if there's anyone on the panel who has information about that. I think there was a press announcement very recently oh, really? within the past three days about the consultation process. On, online, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. it was a mainly online consultation, yeah. maybe some other features. I mean, it didn't strike me as being particularly robust or open, uh, and it's rather late, um, but I'm not a representative of government. <laughs> <laughs> Nor as it turns out am I. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this gentleman over here in the blue shirt, and then we'll come back to this microphone. Hi, so I'm a master's in forensic psychology student at St. Mary's, and um, I'm conducting research, trying to take um, um, look at questions to the student body regarding various issues with the legalization of marijuana, and so we're looking to take or to, to ask these questions pre-legalization as well as post-legalization, and I'm just curious to what you guys think would be the most relevant questions to be asking at this opportunity since it is sort of a natural experiment that we can collect data pre and post um, this law being passed. What, what, what are the most relevant things I should be asking at, the, at this opportunity? It's hard, for, I, I mean, I think it's a little bit hard for us to say that without um, being partnered to your to your research hypothesis. Yeah. So. I'm sure if you write any one of us, that might provide, uh, you know, by email an opportunity to have, uh, you know, a bit of a dialogue and we can copy it to our fellow panelists. It's, it's a difficult question to yeah. ask off the top, so yeah. I, I won't presume to answer it, yeah. but, but I'm sure people would be open to corresponding. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be the best way to, to do it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Sure. This gentleman up. at this microphone. My name's Alex LeBlanc, and I started a, a mobile dispensary in my area, a Woofle, Nova Scotia. Um, I am uh, a cannabis megadoser. I suffer from a rare form of multiple sclerosis, and I have managed to get off over 10 pharmaceutical drugs by megadosing cannabis. Um, it has been very difficult. I'm very poor. I'm on regular social assistance benefits. And I have been asking for help for years. So um, I'm also on another rare program. So I have a self-managed care program. So over the years, my caregivers, my relationships, my partners, my children, every relationship I ever had has been threatened because I've, need cannab I've needed cannabis. I have three children. I've never had any complaints in my community made about me. I'm currently under investigation by the RCMP for selling medical cannabis and growing unregulated because I don't have a family doctor and I haven't had one for two years. I am federally protected. I have a right to grow, not clearly at my current residence, but I'm one of the people who's suffering in your limbo. I guess my question is, what are you going to do about the poor people on social assistance who know their rights, who are stuck in the gray area 
and have no choice. You all put on your pants and go to your jobs. I live this way. I have no way out. So please explain how I am to survive as a megadoser of a medicine who, is, who cannot get it funded, and I would not trust your licensed producer sources with the making of my medicine. So how do you plan to address my situation as it sits right now? I'm, I'm going to begin by saying, just so everyone is entirely clear, um, I mean, we're here as a group of experts, but we're not here as a governing body that has the authority to make decisions. I just want to make that very clear. <laughs> um, anyone want to take a shot at this one? Um, well, I certainly think that, that uh, medical cannabis products should be part of the formulary that uh, uh, is uh, paid for under the public purse for persons who are in need. So uh, I, I'm not, again, speaking for government, but it seems to me to be a wholly legitimate expectation uh, that uh, your medical needs would be fully covered. But, I mean, I, I, I don't know who else on the panel can say anything. You know, I, it, it's obviously people in government who should be responding compassionately and appropriately to you. Yeah, yeah it's, it's developing, right? And, and, and even today, there was uh, a case that was set out that, that it are forcing benefits, um, um, health benefits companies to, to provide um, this to the plan uh, recipients, to the, to the plan members. Um, so, you know, you're quite right. It, this has been a long road, I, whoever said it over there as well. It has been a long road. but. Uh, gradually, what we're as this legislation makes its way through, um, you know, you you are seeing a a this this uh, and I think you said this to me before a couple of times. This is a cultural shift that's taking place in this country, and it's not going to happen all at once. Uh, but you know, over over the next, uh, I think over the next little while, you're going to see more and more. Uh, provincial governments, uh, the federal government, come to the realization that they have to respond to cases just like yours. Okay. All right. This gentleman in the blue shirt. Yeah. Hello. Um, my name is Aaron Prosper. I come from Eskazoni First Nation. Uh, I sit on the Dalhousie Senate as the Indigenous Students Representative. Um, and so my question, um, it might be geared towards Daryl Dexter or Anne McClellan, um, but my concern is um, the legalization of marijuana and as it pertains to First Nations reserves. Um, you, if you're familiar, in December 2016, uh, the AFN brought forward a motion to lobby the federal government to engage in consultation with First Nations communities. Uh, in a report that you chaired uh, in November, there was uh, bits and pieces that there was some consultation. But then, according to Isidore Day, um, chief Isidore Day, the regional chief for the Ontario region in April 2017, um, he said there was little to no consultation with First Nations. And I say this quote from Isidore Day, First Nations jurisdiction on health and social systems and economic rights must be the starting point for dialogue with Canada on the legalization of marijuana, says regional, um, Ontario regional chief. And so seeing that the federal government has mandated the provinces uh, to le um, run this legalization, it then again puts um, First Nations in limbo because provincial laws don't always um, pertain to First Nations communities because First Nations communities are under federal jurisdiction. And so to me, it's not just a bigger debate, it's also a question of are we going to legitimize self-governance within First Nations communities? I think it's an opportunity for the federal government to do that. Um, but right now they haven't, and they haven't given First Nations the opportunity to um, to self-regulate, to uh, put their own legislation because they're used to the umbrella of the Indian Act and we're not allowed to do that because it's illegal and we you know, pretend to hold hands and sing and say we support self-governance but essentially we're out of the conversation. And so my question is, do you think the federal government will give that autonomy to First Nations community to self-regulate and to you know, benefit from the economy because we have so many, like our Af um, African Canadian relative said here, you know, we are we are in the same boat, um, and it looks like we won't even benefit because we're in the limbo of, you know, and 
almost like healthcare and Jordan's principle, are we gonna be put back into this debate of is it federal or provincial jurisdiction within the First Nations community? Um, you know, why not have us on the forefront in these conversations? Okay, thank I you. can speak to what we did as a task force. We had a specific round table for Aboriginal Canadians, and we had a number of uh, representatives from Aboriginal communities uh, at that gathering, not as many as we would have liked. We also heard individually in the form of written submissions from a number of First Nations across the country in terms of what uh, they were hoping to see as legalization and regulation moved forward. At the round table, it was interesting um, in that uh, just as with uh, any community, you had elders who spoke passionately about their concern about legalization of cannabis because of the addiction problems that the elders were living with and helping young people deal with in their respective communities. Um, so we heard that side of the concern around legalization of cannabis. And on the other hand, we heard from numbers of people in communities across the country about the potential economic opportunities, especially as cultivators, that might exist for Indigenous communities. And in fact, there are Indigenous communities that have entered into already joint ventures, for example, with non-Aboriginal investors and cultivators. Uh, one of those people, actually one of the chiefs, was at the round table to which I referred. Was that Phil uh, Fontaine? No. Uh, but Phil certainly has attended events where I have been present and has talked about his and others' interests in this area. Our recommendation was a general one, that the Government of Canada work closely and consult closely with Indigenous communities across the country to ensure, one, they understood the interests and concerns, and two, that there, were, uh, there was a clear understanding and opportunity to participate economically. Thank you, Ann. I'm going to go over to the gentleman in the black. Um, uh, Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Willem Gagnon. I'm from Quebec, Montreal. I'm a first year commerce student here at Dalhousie. And uh, I've been following the marijuana trend for a long time in terms of an economic standpoint. I'm not a pro, uh, I'm not really pro like, uh, you know, everyday use. I'm very pro like when it comes to medical use. Nonetheless, uh, since it's becoming quite a large commodity in Canada, is it ever going to go to an international scale in terms of sale? And I guess that'd be a question for Mrs. McClellan. Uh, you mean in terms of Canadian producers? Yeah, because we're like the first country. Canadian to producers so. now pr uh, sell into, a number of producers have received export permits to sell into countries such as Germany, Australia, uh, for medicinal purposes. Uh, I would anticipate, and I believe licensed producers are anticipating, uh, that there will be a larger global market that develops, especially on the medicinal side, and Canadian producers uh, want to be able to, where appropriate, meet that market demand. Thank you so much. Thank you. This person here, yeah, your turn. Hi there. My name's Nicole Barzagar. Um, I used to manage two dispensaries here in town. Um, I'm also part of the Dispensary Association, and my question for the board is, what do you think the, um, the layout of the province speaking to these small business owners that use these dispensaries, these medical dispensaries, to feed their families and, and all these other kinds of things? And also, what is your plan when it comes to taking all of these um, growers that have been in the industry for 20, 30 years who created this culture and basically made it, made it what it is today, who have fought every single day toward where we are now. How are they going to be incorporated into this new system? And what does the province have to say about speaking to all of these business owners that have come up all across the province? Yeah. I'm just going to interject here again and just remind everybody, yep. we don't have a group of policymakers here. We have a group of experts here. Yes. So, uh, but if there's anyone on the panel who wants to respond to that. Uh, yeah. um, there was two parts to the question. Yes. The, the first part was, the first part was, is the province, what do, what's the framework going to look like for the province to sit down and talk to these okay. business owners? So this is the, this the really dispensers. the same question, same question though on consultations. As far as I know, the only thing the province has announced is a set of online consultations. consultations. Um, 
they they haven't announced uh, anything uh, further than that in terms okay. of uh, engagement. Okay. Okay, I think this gentleman. Now, I did promise the panel we'd be finished and by. We did answer the other part at, yep. in terms of bringing people in. I, yes, but how I do you plan to that. do that? Because you guys have, like, the, the, the country has criminalized all these people that have been in this. So, unless you're going to completely forgive and bring this community in, with well, the that's what I said. I said, yeah. at least as far as I'm concerned in the task force, uh, we did not believe a conviction for simple possession. If you're trafficking, that's a whole other thing. But okay. if you have been convicted for simple possession, we do not see that that should be uh, a barrier uh, in and of itself to people be, uh, being brought into the legal system. And what about cultivation on that part? Cultivation what? Cultivation, growing. No, that's what I'm talking okay. about. Because you just said possession. That's why I wanted to clarify. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. This, I see. Sorry. I, this, well, this my, gentleman. My here. question is uh, is very similar, just to direct it in a different way. Obviously, you're not government representative. I've tried to contact local gov government re representatives just to get some information about consultations, um, and haven't gotten much information back. So my question is quite simply, you know, how can all these good people here that are, you know, from the dispensaries, from the growers, all these small businesses that do provide for their families. Uh, what can we do? Who can we talk to? Who can we, what, ca what cage can we rattle uh, in order to get our views across that we don't want the Ontario model, like you said, um, Mr. Dexter? So, um, <laughs> just that, how, what's your advice as to engaging the government? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, it's one that I get paid for frequently. Uh, apparently, with uh, duffel bags of cash. <laughs> who, who knew? Um, you're not the, supposed to take double back. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I told you that. <laughs> but, uh, no, I, Please, se yes. seriously, yes. I, I mean, at this point, uh, for this province, the only thing you can do in terms of, I mean, you have to have a strategy, an engagement strategy for uh, whatever the consultation um, process is going to be. And, and my understanding is, from talking to Chris is that the, the that the dispensaries have, in fact, gotten together here. They're forming an association for the purposes uh, of, uh, of uh, responding to whatever that consultation program is going to be. I mean, that is the way that you go about doing it. You, you have a narrative. You have a narrative that you that you want to tell, um, uh, and uh, you know. I mean, I, there there are actually two places for you to do that. There will be. Um, there will be opportunities uh, federally if you want to address changes to the actual uh, act. Either at this point, because the health committee hearings are already done, uh, perhaps at the at the uh, Senate. Okay, thank you. Now we're running out of time, so uh, yeah, we're getting the song. We can only take one more question. I'm going to take this woman here. I think you've been here the longest. Uh, my name is Deandra Phipps, and I'm the manager of corporate affairs for National Access Cannabis, and we run oh, yes. a, a number of clinics across Canada. Sure. Uh, we are a medical clinic, and we hope to engage in the recreational market moving forward with uh, retail distribution. So I just wanted to thank you all for coming. It was a great panel uh, and a, a nice variety of uh, expertise, so I, I do thank you for your time. Um, you know, there's a lot of big issues ahead, and I thank you for tackling those head on. It was refreshing to hear your opinion. Um, I think we can all agree after hearing you speak that the leg legacy costs of sick days, uh, the build-outs that the government is facing, as well as the training and the other things that you mentioned, far outweigh a private approach where the industry will have innovation, consumer choice, variety. Um, with this in mind, uh, we've also just heard at the minister's meeting that there will be a recommendation for a special uh, excise on tax on marijuana at 10%, mm. split 50-50 with provinces. Now, I don't know if this will necessarily divert um, the black market sales, and if we, with a little help from my friend Evan here on the math, uh, for example, New Brunswick wholesale is at 650 uh, per gram. The tax will only really allow them to charge 850 per gram, which will, uh, you know, get to that $10 mark quite quickly, which is not going to be able to compete with the black market. So, uh, two-part question. One, how will New Brunswick make money <laughs> if this is going to be kind of the roll-up moving forward? Um, and second uh, part is to look at Ontario, how will, you know, 
if it fails, <laughs> if this approach fails, um, you know, what, what is next af after that? Um, because I think there's a lot of public opinion right now uh, on their approach, and uh, it sounds like you may not be in support of a, a crown run approach, so what's next if it doesn't work out? That's a big one. Well, I just saw the story come across uh, as well. So, uh, but I wasn't clear from the story if the 10 percent excise it says it's supposed to be. So, this would displace any provincial excise tax, but not displace the HST. Right, the federal. So uh, you would get a 10 percent tax, and then you would get a tax cascade because you get an additional 15 percent on top of that. Oh, yeah. that's. Well, the state of Washington learned that if they impose taxes Illicit. that are too high, you're not going to get people out of the black market or the illegal market. And we in the task force were quite clear about the fact that price point is important here uh, for a number of reasons, one of which is to deal with the illegal market. Um, and if you tax this product too highly, obviously people, and price points are especially important for young people. Maybe not for boomers so much, they're gonna go the quality route and all of that. But for young people, price point matters. And that's why you want to keep that price as low as possible and why governments should not be, um, at least in the task force's opinion, uh, you know, slapping on heavy taxes, mm -hmm. seeing this as a revenue issue as opposed to a public health and public safety issue. Okay, now one of the jobs of the moderator is unfortunately to bring an end to the proceedings. We're just a little bit beyond time. So um, to those of you who didn't get your turn, I want to say I'm sorry there was only so much time. But let's take this moment. I want to say thank you to everyone for coming out. And again, thank you to the panel for your time. Thank you.